All right. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to go on with it. Starting now with some neurophysiology. We're going to take what we know now about the plasma membrane um, and see how it applies in a specific physiological setting, such as when nerve cells behave. How is it they behave? What is happening? What is controlling it? <clears throat> there's a lot going on here, so there's a lot to talk about. Now, nerve tissue and muscle tissue, so the cells that are in the, this, these two types of tissue, um, have a unique ability to become excitable. <clears throat> Movement across their plasma membrane, when some of these channels allow the passage of ions to go across it, uh, creates a, a situation of excitability that can then, that ex that excitement or, or nerve impulse, so to speak, can then be passed on uh, down the cell to a neighboring cell and so on, and you can get an effect out of that. Um, something could, could happen, such as a, a muscle contraction or something like that. Um, so these two types of tissues are certainly excitable. Now we're going to focus on uh, neurons, and uh, not the next lectures, but the one after that, when we start in with Chapter 8, we're going to talk about muscles, and we'll look at how this applies to actual muscle tissue. What is a muscle contraction? How physiologically does it happen? what factors control it, what could go wrong with it, that kind of thing. Um, but bottom line, what is happening here is they are undergoing very, very rapid changes in their potential. Now, what I mean by potential is keep in mind, whenever you're, you're pumping out, let's say, sodium to the outside of a cell, and potassium is in higher levels on the inside of the cell, and if you have you know, more positives on one side than the other or more negative on one side than the other, what you have created is what's called a potential. It's just sort of like when things diffuse, if you put a whole bunch of it over here and a little bit over here, you've created a gradient, right, by which diffusion occurs. And the bigger the difference, the faster you'll see diffusion occur. Well, this potential is sort of like a gradient, okay? So by moving ions and storing them on one side and, and keeping other things out and, and keeping things separated, you've created what's called a potential, an electrical potential, a place where electrical uh, activity wants to move, such as the movement of ions, the movement of sodium. Okay, now they have a certain resting potential. The resting potential of most cells, like a nerve cell, is going to be negative 70 millivolts. Now what negative 70 millivolts means is a couple things. First of all, there's a negative sign in front of it. What does that negative sign mean? It means that the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside of the cell. Okay, in other words, there's maybe probably more positive charges on the outside of the cell. Uh, another way you could look at that is there's more negative charges on the inside of the cell. Either way, you've created a potential where the inside of the cell is more negative, negatively charged than the outside. Now what that means is if these gates ever open, what you will see is a whole bunch of positively charged ions, like sodium for example, will come rushing inward towards the inside of the cell. Number one, because of diffusion, just because there's more of them out there. And number two, because there's a potential electrical potential. There's a difference there. There's more positive out here more negative in here, so naturally that's where it's going to want to go. Now, <clears throat> they can take a resting potential, which is about negative 70 millivolts. Volts are just a, a, a number to express how big the potential is. Like you know, these, the plug-ins in a typical wall, um, you, you know that there's typical outlets like that, and then there's the big ones like you plug in your air conditioner or your dryer to. Right? You've got 110 volt versus 220 volt on average outlets. Those voltage, the bigger that voltage number, the bigger the potential difference between the amount of electricity behind where it's, the, the amount of electricity that, that could come forth versus uh, the amount of electricity that you possess. Um, that 110 means there's a, a measurement of what's equivalent to 110 difference between you and that source of electricity. So the higher that difference, the more violently it's going to come in towards you and the more of it's going to come at you. So if you go to a, a substation and you you see the sign that says danger, 2,000 volts. There's a huge, huge potential difference between the amount of electricity that's there versus the amount that you have in your body. So when you touch that and you create a connection, it's going to shoot right down through that connection towards you, and that's why the bigger that potential difference, the more dangerous it is. We're talking millivolts here. That was 2,000 volts. A millivolt is 1,000th of a volt. So a minus 70 means you know, 70 thousandth. Of, of, a milli, of an actual volt. So this is very small, but we do have electrical impulses being sent through our body. Okay, now what these nerve cells can do is take this resting potential, this normal, okay, a little bit more positive out here, a little bit more negative in here, and then harness that and use that resting potential and change them into 
electrical signals when they start to move. That's what we're going to look at. All right. Some vocab words here. First of all, let's look at the word polar and make sure we understand what polar means before we look at all these words. <clears throat> we have two poles on our planet, right? The North Pole and the South Pole. Something polar means it will have opposite ends. So we have the top, we have the bottom, depending on what you want to call top or bottom. You just arbitrarily pick it when it's round, right? But um, we'll say the North Pole is the top, the, the South Pole is the bottom. Well, if something is polar, it has clearly labeled opposite ends. Now, in a, what we're talking about here, what we're going to focus on is a positive and a negative. Like a battery is polar. It has a positive end and a negative end. Okay? Same thing. All right, so polarization means to cause a, a more drastic difference between two points. If something is polar, it's very pointed in almost an opposite direction. It has very two, two distinct points that are opposite to one another. So polarization is any state, positive or negative, other than zero millivolts. Now, what does that mean? Zero millivolts, if you have a, a potential, an electrical potential of zero, what that means is it's the same on both sides. If that was a potential of zero and you stuck your finger in that light socket, nothing would happen because there's no difference between either side. It's zero. Now, any time that you start changing that, any time... The, the voltage changes, and there's a little bit more positive or a little bit more negative on either side, you are becoming polarized. You are starting to create opposite ends. That makes sense. You think about it. Okay? That's polarization. Any state other than zero millivolts. In other words, any time that you have a potential that exists, any time you start having more of positive or more negative on one side than the other, you are approaching polarization. Okay? So that's what that means. What does depolarization mean? That means you fix that. That means if you start to polarize and you start to get positives on one side, more negatives on the other side, if you shift that back toward zero, as you are approaching zero, you're depolarizing. So you're polarizing, depolarizing, okay, to level the field. What is repolarization? Go figure. It's whenever you go back to being polar again. So here we go. This is zero. This is, this is a nonpolar situation. More positives start to build here. Polarization. Positives start to decrease in number. Or these start to increase in number. Either way, they start to level off with each other. Depolarization. When they go back the other way, or if they go this way, either way, if they start to separate from one another again, that's repolarization again. Okay? Hyperpolarization. What this means is you are starting to become polarized, and then all of a sudden, you go crazy and you shoot past and you become extremely polar in a short amount of time. That's hyperpolarization. Now, if we can keep track of those basic definitions in our head, it'll be easy to understand what's happening at the cell okay, in terms of what do we call these things and how do we keep track of the different parts of a nerve impulse. All right, so we've got polarization. We're starting to go anywhere above or below zero. It doesn't matter. Um, if it's a negative number, if it's a positive number, it doesn't matter. The point is it's separating from zero, and you're going to get across this barrier a potential from one direction to the other. That's polarization. They bring back together, depolarization. They go back, polarized again, repolarization. They shoot way past that point, hyperpolarization. Okay. Now, <clears throat> how do we get this polarization that we're talking about in the cell? It has to do with ions and their movement. Ions meaning especially sodium, potassium, um, and maybe a little calcium, but certainly sodium and potassium. Now, here's what you need to keep in mind. I said that we have a cell, and the cell compared to the outside, so here's the ICF, here's the ECF, and we said that the, in, the ICF is more negative compared to the outside of the cell. It's a negative 70 millivolts. Now, how is that situation achieved? How is it negative on the inside? Because this becomes important trying to follow my, my reasoning here. <clears throat> if this, I guess I didn't pick the greatest color, but you can see it. If this is negative, and this represents a resting potential, In order to, this is a polar situation, okay? Negative 70 means this is more negative 
than the outside. If this was zero, that means on both sides here, there would be no gradient, there would be no potential. But the fact that that's negative 70 means there is a potential. So the question then becomes, how, what, what state does this represent? Is this a depolarized or a polarized state, as you have it right here? Across this barrier right here, do you have a difference to where things want to move in terms of charge, yes or no? Yes. So this is a polarized situation. Agreed? We've got a polar, polarized situation. Okay. Notice what I say here. A flow of positive ions into the cell, into the ICF, depolarizes the cell. Now think about why this is true. For every positive charge that you have, if you have a negative charge, they come together, they cancel each other out. Okay? How do you approach zero? How can you get this number, a negative number, to become more positive? One way to do it is to bring in positive charges. Right? So if these positive charges start rushing in, like, for example, sodium. Sodium has a positive charge. If these things start rushing in, that would be an example of how you can depolarize that particular cell. You can take its negative number, make it less negative, get it closer to zero. It's sort of like that number line that you had on your desk in elementary school. It, it, if you move two spaces to the left, you go to a negative two. If you move two places to the right, you go to a positive two. Either way, you've moved two places. You've moved a distance, an absolute value of two from the point of origin. So this negative sign, whether that's negative or positive, doesn't matter. It shows you that there is certainly a difference. There's a potential there because it's not zero. All right. You can, if you have a flow of positive ions that go into this cell, you can help neutralize that negative charge, bring it closer to zero. If two positives come in, it goes to a negative 68, right? Is that closer to zero than a negative 70? Yes. It's not much, but it is. Therefore, you can say you're making it less polar. You're depolarizing. Okay. What, on the other hand, if you took positive ions, because we have to stick with positive ions, because biologically, what we're dealing with, especially with nerve cells, you're not going to have negatives moving around. So pretty much we're going to have to create all of these situations using only positives. So a flow of positive ions into the ECF. So that means this. If you're going to take this and move uh, positive ions in here and move it out, what will happen? <clears throat> if you have... Negative, let's say you have a negative value in here and you have some positives in here. And when they're added together, you get a negative 70. If you start pulling out positives, what does it do to that negative number? Does it make it more negative or more positive? It makes it more negative. Okay? So what I'm saying here is if you take positive ions and start pulling them out of the cell, they get pumped out and come out the other way. What you're going to do is repolarize. Okay? If you've already done this step, is what I'm saying. If you do the first step, and let these ions come in, these positive ions come in and start to neutralize that. You start to depolarize it. You start to bring it towards zero. How can you repolarize it? How can you bring it back? Start taking some positive ions and pump them back out, right? That makes sense since you put them in to begin with, and that's what changed things. It would make sense then to pump some back out to make it more negative again and then repolarize that cell. Well, what you're going to see is this is exactly what happens. Sodium is going to go one way, potassium is going to go the other way, and that's how you're going to make these changes, how you can make this potential change. Okay? okay, it says from the resting state, a flow of positive ions into the ECF outside of the cell can hyperpolarize the cell. So if you're setting just like this, okay, and this happens, what, what this is basically saying is if this happens and this hadn't happened, all you do is you shoot that negative and you make it bigger. You make it a bigger negative number. Remember, what we're saying here is that positives come in to neutralize some of that negative. That gets closer to zero. That's, that's uh, depolarizing it, getting it closer to zero. To counteract that, to repolarize it back, you shoot some positives out. Makes sense. Now, what happens if this happens without that ever happening? What if positives get shot out of there without any other extra positives coming in? You're going to make it more negative is what's going to happen. Okay? That's going to be hyperpolarization. You're going to make it even farther away from the initial point that it was. Am I making any sense here? Okay. <clears throat> so here's a graphical representation of what we're talking about here. Here's negative 70. This is where we're sitting. This is our cell, our nerve cell. As, it, as things, let's say, uh, come in, say p positive charges come into the cell, what's going to happen? It approaches. It becomes a little bit more positive, a little bit more positive. It's still a negative value total, but it's more positive than it was. It's closer to zero. We 
call this depolarization. Now, what if we wanted to correct that? What if we wanted to fix that? Well, we start shooting out. We start taking some of these positive charges that just came rushing in and shoot them back out. We can drop this back down. This is repolarization. We're going back to the point we started. Okay. Now, what if we're in this situation and we shoot some more out? Now, we've all set that balance to the point where we've made this actually more negative on the inside. We've dropped down. We've hyperpolarized. Okay. All right. Now, keep all that in mind. Wimp out on me? I don't suppose anybody's got any batteries, huh? Triple A. <laughs> Heard a funny joke the other day. Oh, I, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I think I'm good. But keep in mind, though, I might need it in a minute. But I gotta tell you my joke. You guys ever heard of Dimitri Martin, the comic? Anyways, he was talking about batteries. He's like. Why is it there are no B batteries? Because there's A batteries, you know, C, D batteries. Why no B batteries? He said he thinks it's to eliminate confusion because you, know, you might mistake it for someone stuttering. Like, I would like some B batteries. You know? like, what? Okay, what size? B. I want some B battery. Anyway, it was funny. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyways. All right. Now, something called a graded potential. Um, if you think about uh, a grade and what a grade is, I'm going to talk about a letter grade. I'm talking about like the land, like the grade of the land. You're talking about sort of like the angle of inclination, you know, how, how high up it goes, that kind of thing. So this is sort of like what we're dealing with here. Um, a graded potential is when you're going to have, now you have a, a, a membrane that wraps all the way around the cell. Okay? And what you've got to realize is this ionic movement that is happening could only, could be happening only in very specific spots of that cell at any given time. It doesn't have to be happening at every single channel on the entire membrane. It could only happen at very little, little places. So these little places that occur uh, set up in the, like potentials. The, the total potential may be a negative 70. But it could be that that's sort of like an average. And then if you start looking around at any particular spot, it may not be exactly negative 70 at a particular spot on the membrane. And it could be lower, it could be higher, it just depends. These are all the graded potentials that I'm talking about. The graded potential is, some, is a potential that is set up at like one particular point on the membrane, just arbitrarily that you pick. Okay? So you can obviously see that the potential that exists, the positive-negative difference on the inside-outside of, of a membrane, um, could vary a little bit from place to place as you go all the way around. Um, so because it can vary, it, it has varying grades, we call it a graded potentials. Okay? Um, now, what we... What we say here is that the graded potential is like an area that starts to change, and the potential can start to change. If, if, if positive charges start to come in, you start to depolarize uh, and that kind of stuff. But what we're saying here is that the change that is occurring, it says is progressively greater as the triggering event becomes progressively stronger. There has to be a triggering event, for example, it's like in nerve cells that are going to cause this. Um, and these triggering events that are going to start opening these channels and start turning these things allowing these ions to move in, the stronger that triggering event, you're going to start getting a greater and greater potential, a, a larger graded potential at that particular area. Okay? And what you're going to see is, that, is if you know, there's constantly fluctuation, there's constantly stuff moving, but if you can get a, a graded potential to reach a certain level, that's what's going to trigger an action potential. That's what's going to trigger an actual nerve impulse that's going to be sent from this nerve cell. You ha you're going to have greater potentials occurring all over the place. It's a matter of, does it ever get to the point where it gets high enough, where that potential difference separates enough and reaches a certain level to cause an action potential to occur? So we have to look at all these graded potentials as a whole to see if an action potential is actually going to happen. Okay? Um, so it says, usually a flow of sodium ions into the ICF. Now, this goes back. I, one of the things from the uh, previous lectures we have sodium and potassium to deal with. Sodium is in higher concentration outside the cell. Potassium is in higher concentration inside the cell. So whenever these things start to move, remember we said the sodium-potassium pump, the whole point is to shove things in a closet, push them uphill, get them crammed into a place so that things like this we're getting ready to talk about can happen. Okay? So they cram them up, they've stored them up, you've got sodium out here, you've got potassium inside the cell, 
And if these gates ever open, sodium wants to come flying in, potassium wants to go flying out. You're going to see now why that's so important when we talked about this depolarization thing. That's how that's going to happen. Okay? So what's going to happen here if we look at, it says, a, usually a flow of sodium ions, since they're on the outside, they're going to want to come rushing in. Now, before they can all come rushing in like mad, there's something that's going to control that, first just realize they naturally want to come in anyway. So there's some channels, there's leak channels, there's a lot of things that can allow them to come in. It's a constant battle that our, our ATP has to be used for to fight is to keep these things separated and try to store up sodium over here, potassium over here. Um, now, <clears throat> I said these, the influx of sodium can help cause these types of potentials that I'm talking about. For example, this graded potential. If for some reason on a particular area of the membrane, more sodium starts coming into this cell, that particular region is going to become more and more depolarized, okay? more than the other regions. The question then becomes, <clears throat> is it a fluke? Is it just a situation where it became uh, depolarized to a certain point? Or is it going to be depolarized so far that it will start kicking in the ones next to it to start becoming depolarized as well, and before long the whole membrane gets that way? So that's what we've got to look at. Okay, now, how long does this movement last? Does it, does it last for fractions of a second? Um, well, all of them last for fractions of a second, but why is one longer than the other? And it has to do with this last point. It says the duration of a graded potential is directly proportional to the duration of the triggering event. And what that means is whatever event is causing these things to start moving, the longer that it is there, the bigger difference you're going to see. That makes sense. That's what it means by to be directly proportional. The, the less amount of time that that triggering event is expressed, the, the less it's there, the smaller the graded potential is going to be. Okay? All right. So take a look at this. You have, here it says magnitude of stimulus. How high? How much stimulus do you apply? How wide it is represents how long you applied it. How tall it is represents how hard it was. Okay. So notice that if the strength is stronger, but for the same amount of time, notice this. Okay. It's a, a, a longer, uh, sorry, it's a, the, the greater potential lasts the same amount, but this one actually is, results in a greater potential than the first one would. If you look at this one, this one's even, a longer, uh, even, uh, even more uh, large in terms of um, the, the triggering event. Same amount of time. Okay. Um, same amount of time from across the bottom, but it peaks at a higher level. You get a greater triggering event. You get more movement. Now, if you look at this one, these two are the same strength, but one is applied for a longer time. The, the box is wider. Notice what you get up here. Uh, the resting potential changes, and it lasts at this new level for a longer period of time. So that's, not, that's nothing too difficult. Um, the application of the stimulus to the triggering event is... is it's the, the, the polarization that you witness is going to be uh, what we call directly proportional to that. The bigger one, the bigger the other. That's all it means. Okay, now, what I mean by this, I'm going to skip that slide and explain these words. I'll explain this on this picture, this next picture. You got it? Okay. Usually... Because we can't assume that there's so much ionic activity happening all around the cell, we cannot assume that every single time ions start trans, you know, going across the membrane that you're going to get some kind of action potential. Otherwise, things would go nuts. So what you see is a lot of graded potentials happening that amount to nothing, basically. Um, <clears throat> take a look. If you, let's say here's the inside. Um, say there's some local trigger, triggering event that causes these sodiums. We'll say these are sodiums out here, okay? Um, and we'll say this is a sodium channel that's allowing some of these positive sodiums to come in. Um, one of the things that we, we said, that the inside of the cell is naturally more negative than the outside of the cell. Um, so as this starts coming in, it's almost like a follow the leader kind of thing. You can imagine that. These sodiums start rushing in. What happens is it sort of fizzles out over a short amount of time. Um, <clears throat> the more sodiums come in, they start to get neutralized by some of the negative charge that's already inside the cell and that kind of thing. Uh, and bottom line is it sort of dies out over a short period of time. You can see this right here. Um, it sort of just fizzles. It sort of, it, the potential gets to the point where it sort of approaches zero and nothing really happens and, and it, it fizzles out. Um, <clears throat> their spread is decremental. And what I mean by that is at first it produces a big change. 
And when I say it sort of fizzles out, as it's going along, it's, it's, it's making less and less of a change in terms of the difference, in terms of depolarizing this. Okay? Um, now, keeping these in mind, you're going to see how they all work together here in a second. Um, don't worry about this. I show you some examples of, uh, I mentioned these, but we'll talk about all these later in another chapter individually, so don't even worry about that right now. Okay. All right, for example, let's say this is the site of the potential change. Here's a channel. The sodium comes rushing in. If the inside of the cell was a negative 70, and you've got a whole bunch of positives rushing in, notice what you see. Right there, it may drop all the way, uh, rise cl closer to zero all the way up to like a negative 55. Now, that doesn't seem like much to you, but it's, it's, it's pretty good in terms of what's, you know, the amount that we're dealing with here. <clears throat> so at first, all this sodium is going to come in, and it's going to offset that, that polarization, make it depolarize a little bit, bring it closer to zero like you see here. But by the time those work and those sodiums do that job and they start passing through, uh, the farther away they get, the less of an impact they're going to start to have because other things can start working against it. Um, and eventually, you'll see over here, not very long, you've not made any change at the membrane on this point in terms of a potential difference. It's still at a negative 70. So you've got just a little area. That's all the place where a potential even changed, which is just one little area. We call this a graded potential in that particular area. Okay, so it moves away in both directions along the membrane from, from its initial point where it came in. Now, <coughs> realize resistance... There's a reason, like, if you have electrical wire that it's wrapped in, like, rubber. You don't just, you know, have all your electrical wires in your house bare and you go touch them. Um, realize that these, this phospholipid bilayer that makes up our membranes um, are kind of like, sort of like rubber in the sense that they are not very electrically conductive. They actually insulate a lot of what's going on here. A part of the reason also why this is sort of going, going to die out over time. There's a lot of molecules in the membrane, just uh, the anatomy of the cell membrane, that help contribute to the fact that this doesn't spread very far. Okay? They sort of just make it die out, absorb some of the charge and that kind of stuff. Okay, now, what, how does all this relate to where we're going with the action potential? Okay, what we have is, okay, a door has a threshold, right? You, you may have a threshold of patience or a threshold of anger. There's a certain line that cannot be crossed, okay? You cross the line of a threshold of the door, you cross them to the other side of that room. Um, <clears throat> in the case of a threshold here, what we're talking about is how much can you depolarize something before something drastic happens? Um, <clears throat> if you're sitting at negative 70 and positives come rushing in and you drop to a negative 60, to a negative 58, to a negative 55, to a negative 50, farther away and the closer you get to zero, the farther away from that negative 70 you get, what, at what point does a threshold get crossed where something big starts to happen? That's what we're talking about here. Okay? We're looking, there is a threshold potential. If that number changes to reach a certain measurement, you're going to see something happen in these cells. You have what's called voltage-gated channels in the membrane. Now remember, there's a whole lot of other channels we've talked about that are in the membrane. We haven't even discussed, hadn't even touched on all the different types of channels that are there. But as far as just in ge generic terms, we know there's a lot of those proteins spattered all throughout the membrane. They're used to transport things. There's a lot of things going on. At any given second or any given moment in time, there's tons of stuff moving both ways. But some of these channels right now and up to now have been shut. They've not even been operating. And the reason is because they are not open until a certain potential is reached. This is where some chemistry comes in. You don't have to know it, but realize that there's a lot of electrical considerations when you get into atoms and molecules. Um, when things start to absorb energy, they start to absorb electrical energy. Um, there's potential differences in electrons. They can start to change their shape. Okay? Um, this is what happens to these particular proteins that make up these channels. Up until now, they've sort of stayed shut. But when that potential st starts to drop and get closer and closer to zero, they will start to change their shape. And when they start to change their shape, you're going to see that they can open and release and allow a huge, massive amounts of sodium and potassium to go in either direction, okay? which can then initiate what's called this action potential. And perhaps you've heard in the other anatomy classes um, the all or none effect. Uh, at least it maybe has been mentioned. An action potential either occurs or it doesn't. It's all or nothing. 
Once it starts, it doesn't stop. There's no gradations. There's not like a little potential or a big potential. There's potential or there's no potential. And the reason is because these gates either open or they don't open Okay, for this to happen. All right, so we have voltage-gated channels. Their gates are controlled by this voltage, okay, this electrical potential. And they're for sodium and potassium. Okay, and those, based upon the potential that's reached, they could change their shape and open when they normally they wouldn't. Okay, so we know now that the flow of sodium ions into the ICF, into the inside of the cell, can reverse the membrane potential from negative 70 to, in this case, what you're going to see is it can hyperpolarize big time all the way up to a positive 30. Now realize what that means. That means if greater potential is happening, we go back to this, if this starts to happen, if you can get a situation or situations like this to where this drops to a certain level, I'm going to tell you that level in a second, if this drops to a certain level, what you will see is that all around here, those voltage-gated channels will open. Previously, they would not open. The second they open, your payoff comes from hoarding up all that sodium and all that potassium that our, ATP, that our pump has been using ATP to, to pull out of there and separate. Because at this point, if this threshold is reached and these voltage channels start to open, whoosh, all of a sudden sodium is going to come flying in. And when sodium comes flying in, if you're setting at negative 70 somewhere, it's going to fly in so much that it's going to climb, 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 neutralize all that charge, climb all the way up to zero, and it's going to have so much momentum coming behind it, it's going to shoot past zero and actually build up more positives on the inside of the cell for a second because it's going to have so much that, that came in. It'll take it all the way and make the cell positive compared to the environment for a minute. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Now, you realize that this is a problem. Our cells can't stay this way. If all this sodium comes flying in like that, guess what has to happen? If we, we want a resting state, in order to use this cell again, in order to use that nerve, that cell that's part of that nerve again, okay, what is going to have to happen is we're going to have to get back to our normal resting state. It's going to have to go back to a negative 70. How do you think it does that? There's two things that can move. You're very close. Yes. You're going to, sodium came flying in. Now, you're right. You could take that sodium. If we had cells that could think, they could gather up all the sodium and pump it back out. But the cell's not designed to do that. What is it designed to pump back out in massive amounts? What's well, already hoarded up on the inside of it? Potassium, exactly. So what's going to happen is this greater potential will reach a threshold. If it reaches a certain level, these gates are going to, the floodgates will open. Sodium will come flying in. It'll come flying in so fast that that number gets to zero so fast that it can't stop at zero. It's like a semi-truck slamming on the brakes. It ain't going to happen. It's still going to skid for a long while. Okay? That sodium is going to come flying in. It's going to come in so much that it's actually going to turn it to a positive charge on the inside of the cell. How do you get rid of all that excess positive? Well, there's two ways. You could bring in a whole bunch of negatives, but we don't work like that. Instead, you take some positives that are inside the cell and shoot it back out. What is already in abundant supply on the inside was potassium. Our sodium potassium pump already loaded it up that way. Okay? So it's sitting there in a big store ready to go. And, and then what will happen is, like with sodium, voltage-gated potassium ion channels will open. And all of a sudden, a big massive efflux of potassium will fly out of the cell. And we've swung up, we've swung back down, and now we can start getting back to where we were. All this happens in fractions of a second. It's quite amazing, actually. Okay. Clear as day, right? Um, hopefully I can show you some animations that will clarify some of this. Okay, so keep in mind what's going on here. We're sitting here at negative 70. Our cell is just resting. It receives some sort of local stimulus. A graded potential, it could be anywhere on the membrane. There's constantly graded potentials happening. Some of them don't amount to jack squat. Okay, um, so what's, that, what's that guy's name? The motivational speaker that Jeff Farley's character. Saturday Night Live, you know what I'm talking about? Van down by the river guy? Uh, never mind. All right. <clears throat> um, I was thinking of, you won't amount to jack squat. Things you did. Never mind. Yeah. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a writer. Oh, that's nice. whoop de doo You're not going to amount to jack squat. Um, <clears throat> anyways, here's your negative 70. You're resting. Okay? Um, <clears throat> these graded potentials start to allow some sodium to leak in. 
And as more sodium leaks in, you can see that this number starts to get closer to zero. It starts to neutralize some of that negative charge. Well, what if you hit about negative 50? Turns out that's going to be this threshold that I'm talking about. If at a particular point in the membrane, an area, a graded potential, produces enough of a change to cause a negative 50 to be reached, at that point, all of these voltage-gated sodium channels open. And when they open, look what happens. They come flying in. And when they come flying in, down, 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 this would be a perfect nonpolar state where it would be all balanced out. But guess what? It can't stop. So it keeps going to the point where it reaches all the way up to a negative, now a positive 30. You could probably go even higher than that, but something happens. At a point in here, when it starts to increase, you have potassium channels. Sodium channels opened at negative 50. Potassium channels like to open somewhere around in here. So once that is reached, the potassium channels start to open. So what it does is it sort of reverses this because now all of a sudden, realize there's still some sodium moving in, but now all of a sudden a whole bunch of potassium starts moving out in the other direction. It sort of shifts everything. And this starts to drop, drop, drop. You're losing a whole lot of positives on the inside of the cell. It's going out. So you're taking it back to the, what the negative state. You're approaching that like it was at the beginning. It keeps dropping, it keeps dropping. And what you're going to see is for a moment, this is going to... Um, I will have a little hyperpolarization here because just like with the sodiums, the potassiums can't stop on a dime. There has to be a slow trickle down. So as they start flying past, yes, it would be perfect if they could stop right here. But that's not the way life works. They, they, they leak on. They, they start to shut. A few of them trickle on. And then eventually, sodium-potassium pump starts working right in here. It grabs onto things and, and puts it back to normal. And then we're ready to do it all again. And any time between here and here, an impulse cannot be sent. Okay? There's a refractory period. Only when we're setting at negative 70 can that impulse be sent. Any time between, you can stimulate that cell and nothing will happen. There will be no nerve conduction of, the, of, the, of that particular setup. Okay. Let's take a look here. Same thing we're talking about. I just explained this. Let's look at the channels that are involved. Okay? Negative 70, you're setting at resting potential. Here's what you got going on. You've got a uh, little bit more of a negative charge on the inside, a little bit more of a positive charge on the outside, hence the negative 70. Okay. Notice that you have some sodium, a sodium channel here, a potassium channel here, and I want you to notice that those are the voltage-gated channels. Those are not the leak channels. Those are not the other kinds of channels. These are voltage-gated. They look a little different. As they are sitting like this, sodium cannot go through. Potassium cannot go through. Okay. All right, so... Graded potential start to happen through, through the other channels that are not mentioned. Well, what happens if enough sodium starts to move in, whatever is causing it to move in, we'll skip over that part. Whatever is causing it to move in, what if it causes enough of it to move in at one particular area where you get all the way up to a negative 50? Well, what starts to happen is what you see here. <clears throat> see that first gate called the activation gate there? It starts to open. Now, as it starts to open, these things are starting to rush in. As soon as it starts to open, they're going to come flying through that. So right there at that point. Now, once they open, look what happens. Okay? A whole bunch of sodium starts rushing in. When that sodium starts rushing in, that's going to be this peak. It's going to be this climb that you're seeing on this graph. Okay. <clears throat> There's an, an action potential begins. There's an explosive depolarization very, very quickly, approaching zero, to the point where it actually ends up surpassing zero and becomes a little bit positive. Notice still, the potassium gate is closed. There's nothing. If the potassium gate was open, you wouldn't see any of this happen. It would, it would just, they work in opposite directions to cancel each other out. Okay. All right, so what happens? You reach a peak. As you're starting to reach this peak, notice what is now happening. You've got this other arm of the sodium gate, almost like a little ball and chain kind of deal. If you look at the, the chemistry of it, that's sort of even what it looks like. It starts to move its way over and start to plug up this hole. Okay? Now, that's slowing down the amount of sodium that comes rushing in as that hole gets plugged. At the same time that starts to get plugged, the potassium gate starts to open. So guess what starts to happen? A whole bunch of potassium starts leaving and rushing out. You can see it right here. The sodium now cannot enter. The potassium can exit. And when it does, it reverses this. It's getting rid of all this positive that was built up in here now and dropping it back down 
hopefully bringing it all the way back down to where you started. So there's what you see. Brings it all the way back down to the point of actually shoot it past a little bit, like I said here. These guys switch places. Uh, this falls back and that closes at the same time so that you know nothing actually comes out. Okay. And here you go. That starts to close. It slows down. You've got to realize, the reason I say they can't stop on a dime, that has to do largely with the fact that these don't just snap shut. The second they, they reach that, they don't just open and then all of a sudden snap shut. It's sort of a slow closing. And the fact that it's slow closing, less and less and less and less and less, and it slows down and it starts to leak out. And that's how come you, you get this, you know, pass zero kind of thing, this dip, dip down right down here. You can't control it perfectly. Okay. All right. And then once these are closed, your sodium potassium pump can reload. And they can, anything that's not at negative 70 now, it can move it in the appropriate direction, get it where it needs to be. Okay. So, there you go. This caused by sodium influx. This is caused by potassium efflux moving out of the cell. Questions? Well, this is a cure for a migraine right here, no doubt about it. <laughs> uh, I was kidding. Um, all right, any questions about this? Yes? Down here? Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. It, it has to do with... Any time you're moving away, it's, it has to be with a reference point. Anytime you're moving farther away from your reference point is, is when you're going to, like, for example, if your initial reference point was a negative 70, and for temporarily you get to a negative 80, yes, that's past what your original, this negative 70 represents polarization. If you go past that, since you're using that as your resting potential, if you go past that, yeah, we would technically classify that as hyperpolarization. It would, like, in, in nerve cells it will be. Um, it may change when we get into like cardiac cells and, and muscle cells. I'll talk about that later. But for right now, it's negative 50. Okay. okay. Um, something to keep in mind. Sodium channels. When they start to open, what's going to happen is very, very quickly, there's a positive feedback cycle. One's going to start to cause another one to open. It's going to cause another one to open because realize that once they start to open, a whole bunch of sodium starts rushing in. So very, very quickly, the potential starts to change to the point where threshold is immediately reached very quickly all along the line. And it's a feed-forward mechanism. It's positive feedback. So once you get a set of sodium channels, uh, voltage-gated channels that start to open, it's positive feedback. Very, they're all going to start to open now. Okay. Um, all right. We talked about this already. Um, it says... See if there's a picture here. Um, I, I'm going to show you this, this video here in a second. But it says here, um, when an action potential develops, it's going to trigger an identical action potential right next to it. And I'll show you what I mean. Um, say you've got uh, sodium here. Here's a greater potential. It's happening in a certain place. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of, uh, in this particular case, let's see if there's a better one here. Um, <clears throat> negative 70, your greater potential is allowing sodium to enter. Um, it reaches threshold, the sodium gates open, and then realize what happens now. You get a spike right here. What's happening right next to it along that plasma membrane? Here's an axon. What you'll find is in, an, in a nerve cell, the most sensitive part of a nerve cell in terms of, of, of being able to respond to these greater potentials, where you're going to find the highest concentration of voltage-gated channels is what's called the axon hillock. It's this fat part right here. Okay? Right before, it it's, doesn't have a specific area. It's right at the very beginning of the axon where it starts to form. Okay, this whole thing's the axon. Right in here is you're going to have a high density of voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay, so what's going to happen is these voltage channels will open, and guess what happens? Right next to it, at the same time, because there is so much positives coming in, this may not have, have changed at all at first. It was just sitting there. It's still sitting at negative 70. But the second that one area starts to get a whole bunch of sodium come rushing in, it starts to trickle down. It starts to move as it comes in. And it's approaching, it's getting close to the area right next to it. And 
it, it keeps creeping in, and the more positives that start creeping in, guess what? It becomes closer and closer to zero. It starts going from a negative 70 maybe to a negative 65, negative 60 before long. Right next to it, you reach threshold. And when the threshold is reached right here, guess what happens? The gates open. They come flying in. They creep along to the next spot, and it passes it on, and so on and so forth. And this is how you can propagate this action potential. This is how you move that electrical signal from this side all the way down to the end. Okay? So right here, you've got it spiking. The, the same time all this comes rushing in, they start to trickle over to the side, and this is climbing, and this is climbing. Once it reaches threshold, realize next to it, all the way down here, still nothing. They're still sitting at negative 70. They're too far away to feel the impact of that. But the second this one does the same thing as this, it starts to spike. A whole bunch are going to come rushing in. They're going to trickle over here, and that's going to start to climb. Okay? So it's, it's a feed-forward mechanism. And as soon as this is over, okay, after this first one happened, realize the potassium had to fly out to bring it back down. Now, during this time, I said no new, no new nerve impulse can be sent. Okay? You see the same thing. Okay? Um, here's the sodium rushing in. It starts to trickle this way. It starts to climb. <coughs> What's going to happen is it's going to shoot up. Right here at the same time, potassium is going to start flying out right in this region. It's going to head out that way. And they're going to follow. It's going to be a, just a, a pattern that goes all the way down. And that sodium come flying in, potassium coming out, that's, that, that's the wave. That's the wave of depolarization. That is an action potential that will travel like a wave from here all the way to the end until it hits these little knobs and causes other things to happen. Questions? I'm going to show you an animation. here. Good. Clear as day. Oh, glad you all understand that. That was easy. Let's take a look here. This is some abstract stuff. Requires you to see some things in your head. Is this not working? See which one do I want to show you? When the cell membrane is at its resting membrane potential, the activation gates of the voltage gated sodium ion channels are closed and the inactivation gates are open. Voltage gated potassium ion channels are closed. Depolarization is initiated by a stimulus which makes the membrane potential more positive, causing the voltage-gated sodium ion channels to start to open. So threshold As has threshold been reached. threshold is reached, many sodium channels open. Sodium ions diffuse across the membrane, causing depolarization. Voltage-gated potassium ion channels also begin to open, but more slowly. See, they're Therefore, happening at the same time. depolarization occurs because more sodium ions diffuse into the cell than potassium ions diffuse out of it. As the membrane potential approaches maximum depolarization, the inactivation gates of the voltage-gated sodium ion channels begin to close and the diffusion of sodium ions decreases. The potassium ion channels remain open and potassium ions continue to diffuse out of the cell. The increased potassium ion permeability lasts slightly longer than the time required to bring the membrane potential back to its resting level. The extra efflux of potassium ions causes the membrane potential to become slightly more negative than the resting value. After the voltage-gated potassium ion channels close, the active transport of sodium and potassium ions reestablishes the resting membrane potential. We already did sodium potassium exchange. Let me make sure there's nothing on that that I want to see. No, we already did that one. Look at this one. 
An action potential, depicted as a red band, is propagated in one direction along the axon. During an action potential, the inside of the cell membrane becomes positive with respect to the outside. An action potential generates local currents that tend to depolarize the membrane immediately adjacent to the action potential. When depolarization caused by the local currents reaches threshold, a new action potential is produced adjacent to the original one. Action potential propagation occurs in one direction because the recently depolarized area of the membrane is in absolute refractory period and cannot generate an action potential. So it keeps it from going backwards, it can only go forward. Okay. And was there a note on that one? Okay. Um, we know also I mentioned that when we get to that point where there's too much potassium, right? Um, I told you that in order to get back to resting potential, we have to utilize our sodium potassium pump. This is a, a hit on what we've already talked about on that. Um, sodium is pumped back into the ECF, and potassium is going to be pumped back into the ICF, into the inside of the cell. And the reason for that is for what we just witnessed, um, so that there's a whole lot of sodium ready to come rushing in whenever those gates, those gates open, and that there's a whole lot of sodium, uh, potassium on the inside to go rushing out to counteract that when those gates open. So that's, that's why we spend so much energy doing that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this stuff you should already know. As far as the basic anatomy of a neuron, the cell, body, dendrites, axons, that kind of stuff. Um, you know that the dendrites are what receive the messages, right? Dendrites really are just axons. Realize that. Um, technically, we'd call all these things axons, but it, it has to do with directionality. Um, is where, if the message is coming in from these things, well, they can give the name dendrite. If they're going away, they're taking the messages towards somewhere else, uh, we'll call it an axon. Now the axon hillock, remember I said, is this area right here? This is going to be very important in the trigger zone. This is going to be where threshold becomes very important. It's where you're going to have a higher density of uh, voltage-gated channels, that kind of stuff. Okay? Now realize uh, a collection, what nerve fibers are, like the nerves that you see when you cut something open. Um, these nerves are actually a whole bunch of bundles of a whole bunch of axons from different neurons. Um, so when these axons, sometimes they get really long. And when other ones come in and they get bundled up and there's a whole bunch of axons running together, we call that a nerve. All right. And remember, this whole, graded, this whole action potential thing we're talking about is propagated along this axon till it, all the way till it gets to the end. Okay, now, as that animation showed, there is a refractory period. There's a point where after this happens, after this flux happens, um, it cannot respond again. And that's very important because it ensures one-way travel. That action potential can't backwash and come back the other way. It's prevented from doing so. It's not physically possible. It keeps going in a forward direction. So th there is a refractory period that, that occurs right after an action potential. When I say the conduction is contiguous, that means it's, forward going, it passes on from one area to another, okay, just all the way down the chain. It is all or none, as you have seen now through these animations. When these things open, either they open or they don't open. Either the sodium is going to move and the potassium is going to move or it's not. You either get an action potential, either when the threshold is reached, it doesn't matter if it gets to a negative 50 or a negative 48 or a negative 30, doesn't matter. Once you get to negative 50, they open, so it's an all or none, okay. Either the action potential occurs or it does not. Now, you may ask yourself, in terms of the stimu uh, stimulating this action potential, <clears throat> how do you stimulate this action potential to get it started, to get it going? And how, if you if you can't have if you have an all or none, then why can um, s neurons, for example, release different amounts of neurotransmitters at any given time? Or how can you have different degrees of muscle contraction, that kind of thing, um, if it's all or none? You would think, well, either you contract or you don't. But you can actually, that's a little bit something different. But um, it has to do with, in the, in the case of stimulating an, an, a nerve cell, action potential frequency. Um, 
the message that is sent by a particular neuron, it is a stimulus for something else. So this stimulus that is being sent by this neuron, the message of its strength is coded for by how, how much distance is between successive action potentials. For example, if I start an action potential and it's going, are they very frequent? It's sort of like if I was holding a rope, okay, and I was going down here and I was making waves with it. Do I bounce it up and down a whole bunch of times and make a bunch of tiny little humps that are really close together? Or do I spread it out and have more time pass in between each successive wave? See what I mean? You apply the same situation to action potentials. To get a stronger message sent, what our body does is packs those potentials closer together. There's a whole bunch of them in rapid succession fired right after one another. So the stimulus strength, the strength of that particular neuron, has to do with how frequent the action potentials are. Are they spread out from one another? Is it go and then go, or is it you know go, 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 go? There's a whole bunch of them right next to each other. That's what that last step is. Okay, now, <clears throat> most of our, uh, well, we have a lot of, of types of cells that are, are nerve cells that are myelinated. You, and you've heard of this in your other classes, uh, myelin sheaths and that kind of thing. Uh, why are they important to nerve cells? Well, obviously, they can protect things, but more importantly, they actually allow our nerve cells to work faster than they normally would um, through a process of what's called saltatory conduction. Um, saltatory conduction means this thing that's being conducted actually hops and skips as opposed to just moves like a fluid from one to the other. I'll show you what I mean. Um, <clears throat> you've got these little gaps. You realize that these little, these little cells, right, they're made of what's called Schwann cells. Um, the, the Schwann cells form like little jelly rolls. They wrap around the axon of these, of these nerve cells. Um, and when they wrap around, first of all, they do two things. Number one, they're insulators. Um, they keep electric charge from being lost. Uh, if this was just bare, a lot of it would, you know, just it could leave, it could escape. This wraps it all up and keeps it like a nice wire going down through there. Um, and also, they have these little nodes, nodes of Ranvier. Right, the little spaces in between all those cells. When you look real close, you'll see them, these little gaps up here. What happens is the only parts on this axon that are myelinated that undergo these potential differences, that, that, where action potential occurs, actually only happens right here. Instead of going through all of this, it separates them so much and creates such a big difference electrically that what happens is when the action potential happens right here, these ions actually jump all the way over here and the action potential starts again over here. It doesn't do it right here, right here, right here, right here. It actually goes here, skips over all of this to the next node. So instead of just walking, it actually hops all the way to the end, and it makes it faster. It allows you to propagate this at a much quicker rate. Okay. Um, now, what forms these myelin sheets? I said Schwann cells. I say Schwann cells form myelin in the PNS, which is the peripheral nervous system out here your arms, the things that you use to contract your muscles and all that kind of stuff. Uh, all these neurons that are firing are wrapped up in Schwann cells that, that make what's called myelin, these myelin sheets. However, in your central nervous system, in your brain and in your spinal cord, you do not have Schwann cells. You have what's called oligodendrocytes. Okay? Oligodendrocytes. Big word. Um, <coughs> site means uh, cell, so we know it's some type of cell. Um, the oligodendrocyte actually, and I'll show you a picture a little bit later, actually branches out in a whole bunch of directions and wraps up all of your uh, neurons that are in your central nervous system. Um, I write down here patho-MS, multiple sclerosis. Okay, some of you know people who are affected by this. Maybe it, it's personal, maybe it's, it's you or someone in your family. Um, <clears throat> what is actually happening in this particular case is these myelin sheaths are being destroyed. Um, some, if you think about some of the symptoms of multiple sclerosis, uh, um, what it boils down to is um, inefficiency of, of neural transmission, um, especially in terms of motor, in terms of muscle, and that kind of stuff. Um, the, 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 the nerve message that is being sent gets impeded because what happens is these Schwann cells are attacked and they start to uh, be, uh, form lesions. They actually form sort of like, almost like tiny little scars and scar tissue. Uh, because of the normal immune reaction that they mount against, um, whether it's a viral, wh whether it's genetic, um, you know, there's, a, there's, there's still a lot of questions about a lot of that. Um, but nonetheless, this hopping and jumping and this nerve transmission 
is slowed down because of faulty myelin sheets. Um, and that's, that's the big cause of, uh, of MS. Notice I write 50 times faster. The fact, by having these things here, um, by having this myelin sheet around your axons, you increase the rate of your nerve transmission by at least a minimum of 50 times faster. So that's of huge importance. Okay? Um, notice what I said about them skipping. Uh, if you look at these as um, myelin sheaths, you'll notice that they're sort of insulated through here. There's not a lot of electrical activity. So what you have is your channels here and your channels way over here. So when these things rush in, realize they don't have to chemically interact and neutralize anything right next to them. They've only got one place to go. The closest thing that they can come in contact with to interact is way across here, way across this gap. So diffusion happens just like that. When they come in, instead of reacting with anything here and, and wasting time creating impulses here, they actually jump this gap, diffuse over very rapidly, and start forming graded potentials here until they reach threshold. So that's sort of, what I mean by sort of skipping and hopping all the way down. And you see the same effect of what we've been doing so far. It's just contiguous. It's just sort of, instead of being contiguous right next to each other, that's saltatory. It sort of just jumps from gap to gap. Okay. Um, some of your nerve fibers can actually regenerate. It depends on a few things. Um, in the case that they do regenerate, the peripheral portion, in, in other words, the, the area that's farther away, right, from the cell body, um, that end of the axon, the peripheral portion of the axon, starts to degenerate. Now, what happens is the Schwann cells in your peripheral nervous system, now, in the central nervous system, with brain and spinal cord, you'll see that those do not regenerate. The, the, they have different myelin coverings. They have oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes do not guide the repair like I'm talking about here. Only Schwann cells will guide this repair. And that's only going to happen in the peripheral nervous system, like where you use your fingers and your arms and legs and that kind of stuff. These Schwann cells can actually guide the regeneration of cut axons. Now, see, you've got to realize it, it depends on where this nerve is cut. Is the cell body destroyed? Is only the axon destroyed? If only the axon destroyed, how much of it is destroyed? And there's not much of it destroyed. If you only clipped a little bit of the end of it, these Schwann cells can form like a little tube, and they can guide and cause your axon to grow back through this tube, and they can wrap it back up when it's done. And you can repair that. Okay? You know, some people have nerve damage that is irreparable. And, and it, it depends on, you know, of those situations, what I just discussed. Others could, you know, you could uh, hook the nerves back together and they work. I was watching one time. I used to watch these videos about, uh, I don't know, on the, the Discovery Channel, Discovery Health Channel especially. It was like medical mysteries and like crazy stuff that happens that people live through. And there was this one lady who was working uh, in, a, in a big industrial setting, and she was working with this blender. Um, and it was static electricity was building, and she had really long hair. And it built up, and it built up, and the static electricity kept, grab you kept grabbing her hair towards and towards the blender, and finally it grabbed onto it, and it twisted around and yanked her scalp off. I mean, it pulled, like, all the way down here to her eyebrow, and pulled it all off, and they showed it. I mean, it was the weirdest thing. You had this, this scalp with hair stuck on it, and she was just, oh, it was gross. Um, but anyway, it was amazing. They had, like, obviously two of the best surgeons. And did I don't know. I don't remember. That's crazy. I don't know. It, I, maybe. I have no idea. But all I know is my point for this is they, they actually took some nerves and they actually patched some of her nerves together because at first they were just, I mean, there's a lot of tiny blood vessels to keep all that tissue alive. Could they patch that all up? So they put that, you can't just put it back on like a hat, right? I mean, you got, you got to sew it all back together. So, I mean, you got, to, you, got to, you got to make sure there's enough vascular stuff in there to feed all that tissue. Um, and what they were finding was that they had a good uh, uh, um, um, arterial flow, but they were having problems collecting some of the venous blood. Um, and pull it, so they used a lot of leeches for a while until they sort of were able to uh, sort of merge back on their own. Um, yeah, but you wouldn't care. It was either leeches on your head or no head, right? So, or no head, no scalp. But um, anyway, it was really cool because they were, they were going through this surgery about how these guys actually had to trace these nerves, which would be incredibly hard to do, to figure out, you know, what nerve was what and how to pull them back together and, like, at such a microscopic level, put them back together. Um, it was amazing. But she ended up being fine, I think. I mean, they showed the after picture. And I don't know what normal would be like after that, but she had looked, like, looked perfectly normal. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. 
No, I don't. It's a chemical plant. I think. Yeah. I thought it was like a big mixer or something for some chemicals. Maybe I'm wrong. Still, whatever it was, it caused her hair to twist up. So. I have a question. Yes. I doubt it. The axon. That's not a dumb question at all. Okay. Um, all right. Now, like I said here, um, when you cut an axon in the central nervous system, you're actually your oligodendrocytes that form those myelin sheaths, not only do they just not repair it, they actually prevent you from repairing it. Uh, they, they work against that process. So uh, it is true that when these cells die, that you don't get them back. Um, ne neurons do not, like CNS, active neurons, they do not divide cellularly. Um, they, they can grow in size as you get older and things like that, but they do not replenish themselves. So take care of your brain. <clears throat> okay, um, now a synapse. You know that a synapse is uh, when two nerve cells basically form a junction to one another. Now they don't ever actually touch. Uh, they will come very, very close, and there's a tiny little gap in between them, right, called the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft. Um, so a synapse is, is when these two things come together. What is very important, and what I don't know if you realize or not, um, and this is why brain, uh, you know, neurology in general is so incredibly complicated, <coughs> because we, we, we know so little about how our brain works, but yet we have all these treatments for things. It's a little scary. But um, notice that one neuron could have feeding into it millions of other neurons. There could be so many synapses all over from, from all the way down here to the actual cell body. There are constantly tons and tons of feeds that are coming in. Not only that, but this particular neuron shoots out just as many of those in the other direction touching other things. So you can imagine how complex the pathways are in our brain. Um, certain things get activated. Never just one cell at a time. There's not like that one message is sent that goes to one cell and that is one thought. You've got to realize that there's you know, different combinations of all these things firing at the same time to create the experiences that you're having. And that is absolutely insane. You should really start to sit down and just think about it. It blows your mind. Uh, anybody watch 60 Minutes last night? You see the um, uh, uh, what's Brain Man, is that what they call him? The guy who, um, he's a very odd case because there, there's a condition called synesthesia you ever heard of it before. It's when your brain is a little bit miswired to the point where all of your, emo not your emotions, but your uh, senses, they fuse. Some of them overlap. For example, um, you, music causes you to see things as opposed to just hear things or feel things or words have tastes to them. Um, at first you think these people are crazy, but further study certainly suggests that there's merit in what they're saying. Like, uh, I saw a special a little while back about a guy who had it, who he would taste letters and taste words. Um, so somehow, those, those sensory inputs in his mind, they got, they got fused together at some point. And like, you know, a certain letter tasted like bacon, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, he could explain that. That was what was neat about it. And he was saying, like, you know, like, this, this word, I hate this word. It tastes like this. It's nasty. Or this word tastes, you know, tastes good. You know, say this word. Um, uh, that would be really weird. How do you, I don't know how you would adjust to your life like that. But the reason that some of this, this came about, too, is because they were doing this one guy who was blind. But what was interesting about him is that he, had, he, had, uh, he wasn't blind from birth. So he had lost his sight, but it, still he was able to experience synesthesia. Um, and he was, you know, um, what generally happens as a result of these people is they usually have these amazing talents in one certain area. Um, and he was really good at music, obviously. Uh, what he was able to do is see like paintings and images and colors when he heard music. And so they would play a tune and ask him to describe what he said. Some of the stuff he said was crazy because where he was at an advantage was because he had, he had his sight before, so he knew what a staircase was. He knew what a book was, that kind of stuff. So he was able to use objects to describe what it was he was seeing. And at first they thought he was crazy. He was just making it up. And then they hook up you know, uh, a lot of instrumentation, look at his occipital region. They would blindfold him, and they would do all this kind of stuff, um, and they would run control subjects. And they would play a song and look at the brain maps of the people listening to a song like Me and You and see that the temporal sides of the brain were more activated and had a lot more electrical activity, very little on the occipital lobe. This guy's occipital lobe readings were through the roof. I mean, he was just, his eye parts were, you know, his visual input parts of his brain was just crazy. 
from this and stuff. So it was really cool. Um, but this guy, just to show you the, the, the power that goes along with this, with this condition, this guy that was on 60 Minutes last night, <clears throat> uh, he was from England. And generally some of the people who have this are like mildly autistic or you know, considered savants and that kind of stuff. They're you know, genius at one thing but can't do anything else like Rain Man. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what, he was, what this guy was able to do is actually function. He was as normal as you could be and still have this condition. That was Rain Man, yeah. There was a real guy. Well, this guy was math. Yeah, 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 yeah. 20,000 digits of pi. 20,000 digits of pi. And, and they asked him how, and he said, and it was really cool. My wife and I started having this discussion <laughs> about it. Because it was neat because he sees numbers. They asked him how he saw numbers. and He sees numbers not as numbers. He sees them as portraits, like landscapes and pictures. You know, and for us, it's a lot easier to remember what a picture looks like than it is a, a number of 20,000 digits, right? So what he, it was amazing because he, what they had him do then was, because he was sort of higher cognitively functioning, draw a picture of the number that he saw. And he couldn't get it perfect because he couldn't draw all that great, but he would draw pi. And it was a really cool picture, like a big swirling mat of colors. And he said, pi to him is the most beautiful picture. No, numerically, it was a beautiful, beautiful picture. It was a complete picture. Everything was flowing. There was all these colors involved, which is cool because mathematically, you ask a mathematician, they sort of, from a different perspective, say it's the, it's the perfect number. It's the most beautiful number. Um, it was really interesting how that goes together. Um, but anyways, it, it's, just, it's just really cool how, how he could think through and how he could see that stuff. And like he was asking, the guy who was interviewing him said, um, I was born in... I was born on such and such date in 19, whatever it was. He said, oh, that's a prime number. You were born on a Saturday, and, you know, your birthday this year will be on a Friday or whatever. I mean, he's able to just see this stuff in his head. It's crazy. I don't know. Anyways, um, let me see where I, if I can stop or not. Uh, let me just say this before we cut out. Um, <clears throat> what's feeding in here? You've got, notice these blue arrows. This is your action potential that's feeding down all the way to this synaptic knob. Now, you're going to have a, a very small space in between. Here's the, what we're going to call a post-synaptic neuron, meaning after the message. This is the pre-synaptic neuron. Just, we just picked these two because this is before. It's coming from this, going to this. <clears throat> What's going to happen is, as these things come down here, this action potential is going to reach, and what you're going to see at the, at the knob are a high concentration of Voltage-gated calcium channels, which are different now than what we've talked about. This is very important because one of the questions on the study guide I know from the first test was what causes exocytosis, what ion. You're going to see this come into play. The fact that calcium is able to come flying in to this cell is going to induce exocytosis. Why is exocytosis so important at this part of the cell? Neurotransmitter release. You've got to be able to release these neurotransmitters from this knob to travel across this gap, to float across the sea, and land at the docks of the next cell in order to start that all over again. Okay? So you've got potassium channels here to do that. All right. Stop there. Make sure you sign the attendance sheet.